extra because we got a lot of extra, extra kids in here. All right, let's go ahead and get started. If you'll uh, turn with me to Exodus chapter four, and uh, we'll continue on where we were at two weeks ago. We had David Standrich uh, here last week, so we did not have our class. We started this text two weeks ago. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, we are going to be probably about another week or more in this verses 1 through 9 section. So this week and probably next week we'll finish out verses 1 through 9. Uh, Okay, so uh, chapter 4, let's start beginning in verse 1. Then Moses said, What if they will not believe me or listen to what I say? For they may say, The Lord has not appeared to you. The Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? And he said, A staff. Then he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses fled from it. But the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand and grasp it by its tail. So he stretched out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. The Lord furthermore said to him, now put your hand into your bosom. So he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then he said, put your hand into your bosom again, and he put his hand into his bosom again. And when he took it out of his bosom, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you or heed the witness of the first sign, they may believe the witness of the last sign. But if they will not believe even those two signs or heed what you say, then you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground, and the water which you take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. Let's uh, ask the Lord's blessing. Our Father, we come before you seeking your blessing upon this time, and we seek it, Father, because our natural state uh, would not understand what we read. We would not discern it. It is to be spiritually discerned. We would not discern it. Uh, We would not obey it. Uh, We would not believe its veracity. And so, Father, we have a necessity of your Holy Spirit uh, that would indwell us and that would uh, illuminate the Scriptures, that would reveal to us what they say, Uh, and apply them to our hearts such that we would understand that these things written uh, many years ago describing the interaction between Moses and yourself uh, and in relationship to the benefits that it would uh, bring to the Israelites uh, at a later point uh, have a very uh, relevant uh, application to us as well. And we're thankful, Father, for the fact that your holy uh, word is one that is... um, is still relevant today in in all matters and in all things of life, and we're thankful that you have preserved it. We do pray that you would preserve us through the observation of it uh, and that we would heed it each and every day. Help us, Father, to do so, for we're we're like those Israelites. We're uh, men of stiff necks and hardened hearts many times, and uh, we pray, Lord, that you might cause us constantly to be seeking after you. Uh, and to to, uh, read your word and to obey it once again. We pray that you be upon each person that is here this morning, that your blessing might be upon them uh, as we study this text. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so this uh, text starts back in chapter 3, and what's going on in chapter 3 through chapter 4? It's all one, up until about halfway through chapter 4, it's all one continuous what? What's going on? Don't all answer at once. What's that? Conversation. Yeah, conversation. There's this dialogue, this exchange that's going on between Moses and God. And God is here appearing as uh, in the burning bush, the bush that will not be uh, consumed. Uh, this bush is burning and Moses sees it as he's out there in the wilderness tending to his father-in-law's flocks. And uh, he notices it. And he says, I must turn aside to see this thing. And when he gets there, he hears a voice that says, Moses, take off your shoes, for this is holy ground. And then the the conversation begins uh, between God and Moses. And it's an amazing exchange between uh, between God and a man in this regard. Uh, It's it's about the longest, I think it's the longest exchange up to this point in the scriptures between God and a man, where it goes back and forth for this long. Uh, Certainly it's spoken to Cain quite a bit in chapter 4, which we compared that a little bit two weeks ago and, and mentioned the fact that God is very patient with people. He was very patient with Cain, a sinful man who never came to repentance. Uh, at least no, no record of any repentance on his part, uh, and he's very patient with Moses, a man who is a, a repentance man, in fact, becomes the Lord's, one of the Lord's greatest servants in scriptures. Uh, even the Jews would hold him out as being that. 
Uh, and so, so God is very patient. And that's really what goes on in this entire section. And I want to emphasize as we look at each part of this section uh, is that we have God's gracious dealing with Moses. He's very, very gracious with him. And so when I prayed earlier about the relevancy and the applicability of scriptures, this is a narrative text from a long time ago. It's very applicable to us. Why is it applicable to you today? How does, how does this help you? Shows us God cares for us, that he's very gracious. He hasn't changed. He hasn't become a God who said, I'm fed up with people. Uh, I don't know why. And, and sometimes, by the way, the Bible does use language like this. We saw that in Genesis chapter 6, where it says God repented of creating man. Uh, and, and we talked about what that meant, uh, that that's not, a, that's not a repentance like we repent of. It's not even a change of mind. It's expressing a grief over the way people are. And he'll do the same thing later on with the children of Israel themselves. When they're being stiff-necked and hard-hearted and worshiping uh, the false calf, uh, the, 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 the God that brought them out of Egypt, the calf, the golden calf, and uh, he'll say, listen, I'll make of you, I'll, I'll destroy these people. And he says to Moses, I'll make of you a nation. And Moses says, no, this is your covenant people. He reminds him of that. Not that God needed to be reminded. It's a test of Moses, and it's an expression of God's grief and anger towards people who will not submit to him in, in both cases. And, uh, and so, but here he's very gracious with Moses, and, and, and he, have this, he has this exchange. And the exchange is, is uh, structured around, around what? There are three what that Moses does. Do you remember? He asks three questions. What was the first question he asked? Uh, who, who was what? Uh, he, asks, he asks, who am I? He does ask, who am I at a certain point? Uh, he asks... He asks, who are you uh, to the Lord? Uh, and then he comes to this question. He says, well, how will they believe, basically, is what, is what this question is. So who am I in chapter 3, verse 11? Who are you in chapter 3, verse 13? In chapter 4, verse 1, where we get to this text right here, he basically is saying, well, what if they don't believe? What if they don't believe me when I go back? I'm going to go back and tell them certain things. I'm here to deliver them. The last time I told them I was here to deliver them, they rejected me as their deliverer? What's going to make them believe me now? So that's his question here. And then God very graciously, in the text we're looking at, by the way, he's been gracious in the first two answers as well. Here he graciously answers Moses' question and says, I'm going to give you three signs, is what he does. And we're going to get those three signs, and we're going to start digging in on the first one today. But then he's going to have two more statements that he's going to make uh, in, the, in this text here. And, and the first one is in chapter 4, verse 10, which we didn't read. He'll say, well, I can't speak. You know, I can't, I can't, I'm not a man of, of eloquent speech. I can't speak to the people, which is ironic because who's he speaking to here? God himself. And he has no problem with expressing his thoughts to God himself. I mean, he might be, don't give me, when I say he has no problem, I don't mean that he just does it without any thought process behind it. He may even be very concerned as he says these statements like chapter four, verse 10, but he says them still. And yet he uses this now as a reason why, well, I can't go to Pharaoh. I mean, he's a great man. And the children of Israel, the elders, they won't believe me and all of this. So I can't do this. I won't be eloquent of speech. I'm not good for that. And then the last statement he's going to make is in chapter 4, verse 13, which is his, his really comes down to a refusal where he says, listen, um, send anybody. Send anybody you want, Lord. But the implication being, don't send me. So we have this, this exchange, this dialogue, this conversation, that, as Daniel called it, between the Lord and Moses, and it's structured around these three questions and then two statements, and right now we're getting the answer to the third question. So that's kind of what we saw. Now the other thing we looked at last time when we got together was the fact that Moses had to be prepared to be the man of God, uh, or the man that God would use to be the deliverer. He had to be prepared to do so. Um, and Moses didn't do the preparation himself to do so. In fact, he didn't do any of the preparation himself. Uh, and we talked a long time ago when we first started looking at Moses, uh, the fact that he was prepared by growing up in Pharaoh's house for the first 40 years. So he learned to be a man of, you know, understood warfare. He understood international politics. He understood large scale national economics. He understood leadership. He learned languages. All of these various things Moses would have learned. And that was part of his preparation to lead, you know, a couple of million Jews uh, 40 or uh, 80 years later. Then he's driven into the wilderness for 40 years. 
and he lives there in the wilderness, and that prepares him to be out there in very harsh conditions and to understand, uh, you know, how to live in those conditions so that when he brings the children of Israel back, in fact, as we said last time, he's bringing them back to the same place he's at right here. This is Sinai where this, this burning bush is at. And he's going to bring them right back to this mountain, God tells him, this place. And when he brings them back, he's going to know how to live in this wilderness. So his preparation has been, you could say, for 40 years for sure, the last 40 years when he talks to God, but 80 years of his life. God's been preparing him to lead the children of Israel. Uh, but that's not the end of his, of his preparation, really, in all of this way. Uh, he's also learning uh, to, uh, uh, in, the, in this very instance right here, he's being prepared to, li- uh, to deliver the children of Israel. So we have a long time period of his life where he's, he's being prepared, but we also have this very short time period, these verses in chapter 3 and chapter 4, where God's saying, okay, you have some objections, some questions, let's go ahead and deal with those, then you're going to go and you're going to deliver my people the way I'm intending to use you to do so. And he's very patient with him right here. So Moses had to learn some patience in the first 80 years, and God expresses patience here with Moses, and he's preparing him even here. And we looked at what God declared himself to be, and that's important because if Moses is going to deliver the the Lord's people, he has to first of all know who the Lord is. In other words, who am I serving when I do this? And understanding the fact that I'm not doing this of my own power, my own authority. Remember, that's what he tried 40 years before. He thought he could do it by his own hand when he killed the Egyptian and said, I'm capable of doing this. I can deliver my people. My means to deliver my people will be violence against my people's enemies. And that's the methodology of deliverance. And the Lord says, no, that's not going to be the methodology of deliverance. What will be the methodology of deliverance that the Lord uses? It's going to be his own word, really. He's going to declare things to happen, and they're just going to happen. And then he's going to take them away, and then he's going to declare the next thing to happen, and that's going to happen, and we get these plagues, then they're going to occur in the coming chapters. But what he showed himself and declared himself to be to Moses in this, I'll just recap these briefly. What he declares himself to be is, first of all, holy in chapter 3, verse 5, where he says, take off your shoes, for this is holy ground. He's holy. First and foremost, God is holy. Uh, That is really, you could say, his central attribute. Uh, the one by which all things are connected. And so he is holy, this is the first thing. The second thing is when he says, I am, he is sovereignly self-sufficient. Okay, he's sovereign and self-sufficient. Doesn't need anybody else, I am, period. Normally when we say I am, we finish it in with a bunch of other things, uh, especially in, in our culture today. When we first meet people, I, I just was at a house yesterday with a, a birthday party and watched the men interact with each other. And you know what the first question they ask is, or the third question maybe? What do you do? What do you do? And, they, and they, the answer comes, well, I am a sales rep. Or the, by the way, we make up all these titles for ourselves, you know, the regional development director of blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, make it sound very, very nice and very wonderful what we do. And, uh, and so, so we, we have this I am statements, but they always follow us something. You know, I am that person's dad. I am that, that, that woman's husband. I am this thing in the world. I am this, I am that. And it's always, it never just ends with I am. But when God speaks, he simply says, I am. He is sovereignly self-sufficient. He doesn't need anybody else. Um, He is timeless. Uh, He talked about, you know, he's he's timeless in the sense that he's the God of the covenant. He is the God of the past who promised salvation to the patriarchs, uh, that they would become a great nation and all of those things, which they were now. He was the God of the present who sent Moses to save his people now as he had planned to do so. 400 years before, uh, and he was the God of the future who would bring them into the promised land, that I will bring them to the promised land. So he's the God of, he's, he's timeless in all those ways, which is once again, what makes both him and his word relevant to us today. If he's not timeless, then he could lose relevancy. He's timeless, okay? Time doesn't affect him. He sees his people's needs in chapter 3, verses 7 through 9, which Chris talked talk to us about. He sees his people's needs. He not only sees his people's needs, but he's concerned about his people's needs. A lot of times we see the plight of other people, and then we just move on to the next whatever. Uh, he sees his people's needs, and he actually is going to do something. He's concerned for his people's needs. Uh, we talked about the fact that in verse 20 of chapter 3, he was going to judge his people's enemies, that he would judge the land of Egypt, uh, a wicked land and a wicked king in Pharaoh, that he would judge them uh, in that way, that he would be a provider for his people was the last thing we looked at, uh, that they would actually have plunder, that they would, come, they would go to the Egyptians and say, in fact, who was it that was going to go to the Egyptians again? It was the women, the women that were going to go, not the men, not the warriors that were going to plunder the nation of Egypt. It was going to be the women 
In fact, they were going to mention their children. They were going to go and say, give me whatever you have, give me your stuff to the Egyptians, and I'm going to give it to my children, is what was going to happen. That's God's authority. That's God's power. He's not using the powerful warriors of, of Israel, if they have any. He's using, in fact, the women and the children uh, by, by default uh, in order to plunder the children of Israel. So he provides for his people also in a way that was completely unexpected. But yet Moses keeps questioning God, and Moses and God keeps answering. Um, and, and the fact is, is that the only people in this whole text who veers from what God says is actually Moses himself. In other words, God never changes his intention and what he's going to do in his plan. And the, the elder of, elders of Israel, when Moses gets down here later on, by the end of this chapter, uh, they're just going to believe what he says, and they're going to comply and say, yes, that's right. In fact, we're going to see just how much they're going to do that in a little bit here. And, um, and, then, and then the uh, Pharaoh, he does exactly what God says he's going to do. He's going he's to reject the word of the Lord, and then I'm going to do these things, and eventually he's going to let the people go. And so in every way, shape, or form, everybody does what God says it's going to happen, except for Moses, who keeps bristling against this. I don't want to do this, I don't want to do this, and all these questions and things like that. Um, and so, so God has his own schedule, his own means, and he's been using Moses. His means and schedule has been 80 years, and now, let's say, 15 minutes, you know, in this conversation here that occurs in chapter 3 and 4. Okay, so that's all review. Everybody good? All on the same page? We had some extra people in here today, so I wanted to spend a little extra time on that. Okay, let's now move on to chapter 4 and verse 1 where we have this final question, uh, before he has two more statements, this final question. Once again, the structure is three questions, two statements. Chapter 4, verse 1, Then Moses said, What if they will not believe me or listen to what I say? For they may say, The Lord has not appeared to you. So Moses now asks the third question, which is, What if they do not believe, uh, do not believe me? Now, were the first two questions reasonable? Was it reasonable to say, well, who am I speaking to? Who are you? And the second question, well, who am I to lead the Lord's people, this great thing you're giving to me? Those are reasonable questions to ask, right? Is this a reasonable question? It sounds reasonable on the surface, doesn't it? It sounds kind of reasonable on the surface. Uh, you know, Moses was going to go and tell them he received the word of the Lord while in the wilderness from a burning bush that was not consumed. Now, if you, somebody came to our church today and said, listen, on my way to church, uh, I saw this burning bush by the road, and I stopped my car, and I pulled over, and I went, and I, the Lord spoke to me from the burning bush, and I've come here today to share the message from the Lord. What would we do? We'd say, please step away from the lectern. Um, you know, uh, lightning may come down. Don't stand next to me, please. Um, and we, wouldn't, we would say we don't want to associate with that. We wouldn't believe that. And he's concerned that the children of Israel will not believe that. And the last time Moses presented himself once again as the deliverer of Israel, they actually said in chapter 2, verse 14, who made you ruler and judge over us? So he's concerned that he's not going to be believed because his last interaction was, we don't believe you. you who made you the ruler and judge over us? So in this case, Moses' view is that there's more proof uh, needed. Uh, his question makes it seems like he's doubting who? It's, he is doubting the Lord, but his question makes it seem like he's doubting the people. Okay, that's what, he's, that's what he's saying. He's saying, what if they don't believe me? He doesn't say to the Lord, what if you don't make them believe me? Or what if you this, or you that, or you... No, his question is, what if they don't believe me? That seems like a reasonable question, but it's not a reasonable question. Because he already told him in chapter 3, verse 18, let's go back and read that. When he says, uh, well, let me, let me pick up at the verse before that. Verse 17, so I said... Uh, chapter 3, verse 17. So I said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, to a land flowing with milk and honey. And then the next question, next statement, they will pay heed to what you say, and you with the elders, not only will they pay heed, they're actually going to go in. The elders of Israel will come to the king of Egypt, you and them, and you will say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with who? Us. Now, did the, did, the, did the Hebrews meet with the Lord, the elders? They did not. But they believe it as much, and they, it's so believable, they actually say he met with us. Because the message that Moses, God gave to Moses is the same message God is giving to us as if we received it from the Lord. 
God has met with us. That's how much they're going to believe it. The Lord tells them how much they're going to believe it. So much so that not only does he say that they will accept what you say, they'll pay heed to what you say, give it credence and, and give it authority and believe that it is true. Not only will they believe it that much, they literally put their money where their mouth is when they say, now we're all going to say, the Lord has appeared to us and he has spoken to us. That's how much the Lord was, was by his word, by his statement, by his prophetical utterance there, uh, was giving Moses confidence that the people would receive him and what he said, that he was the Lord's spokesman, that the Lord was spoken to Moses to speak to them, that they would receive the same word, that it was a word to them and that they could trust it confidently, so much so they literally would put their life at stake by going into Pharaoh and saying, we're leaving. We're going to be walking out the door here pretty soon. Were there slaves? Yes, we get all that. We are leaving. Was it, was it possible for a slave just to walk off? No, it's not possible. But that's what they're basically going to say they're going to do. And so they had so much confidence in that way that that's what they were going to do. They're not only going to believe him once again, they're going to actually be that convicted and pay heed to what he says. So, so what's Moses really doubting here? He's doubting, he's doubting the Lord's word, actually, is what he's doubting. See, he's, he was, he's not doubting the people. He says, what if the people charade? That's a cover. He's doubting the word of God itself. The word of God himself is what, they, what, what he is doubting. So it's not a reasonable question to ask. Um, and there are times, that, by the way, there's a lot of times in Scripture, first of all, this is very clearly a doubt of the Lord because the Lord's already told him they're going to pay heed and you're all going to go in before Pharaoh. But now what he does here is, he, um, uh, he basically cast doubt upon it. There are times in Scripture where people can say things, and unless we knew their hearts, we really wouldn't know why they were saying what they were saying. And the two I think of, and I'm not going to go look at them, and I didn't look at them this morning to remind myself of the exact wording, but uh, when Mary received the word from the Lord that uh, she was going to give birth to a child as a virgin, and it was going to be the Lord's child, the Son of God, Jesus, who would save his people from their sins, the promised Messiah. What was her response? She, she kind of asked a question there. How can this happen? How can these things be? Now, Zacharias, at about the same time, as the, the, the father of John the Baptist, also heard from an angel that said, you're going to have a child in your old age, you and your wife Elizabeth, and uh, he's going to be the pre-runner, the forerunner of the, the Messiah, uh, who is also coming in. What did he say? I don't remember exactly what it was, but it's almost the same language. Now, Mary was not, was she questioning the Lord when she said, how can these things be? She was not. But what happened to Zacharias? He was made mute, so he couldn't speak because he didn't believe the word of the Lord. They sound like the same question. If you read the two texts, they sound like, I wish I would have gone and recorded them, but we could find them, but we won't. But you can look that up on your own. They're really almost the same question. But there's a difference in the heart. What's going on behind the question is what's going on. We know Moses' question here is wrong. It's invalid. It's not a reasonable question to ask. But what we don't know sometimes is when we're dealing with people out there in the world. So always keep that in mind, that we don't know the hearts of men when they ask a question, and it would, it would behoove us to continue to speak with them, but always to proclaim what the Lord says, and what the Lord says will happen, and we can trust in that. You can't trust in me, but you can trust in what the Lord says. So that's what's going on here. We ask this third and final question, and it's not really a reasonable question. Um, and, uh, and so we have to be... Um, I, I guess the other thing we could say about that is this, is that... We often consider, I heard somebody, actually pastor was talking about this yesterday morning in the men's Bible study, that debates, like when you see these Christian debates, whether it's two Christians, you know, talking about pedo baptism or something like that, um, or, or it's a Christian and some atheist, avowed atheist in the world speaking to each other, and they're, they're debating on this subject. And what's the problem with that? Because those debates almost always go to a certain place. Where do they go to? They go to logic. They go to something that seems reasonable. They go to some earthly proof, archaeological things, whatever it is, um, apologetic type statements, things like that. But really, we only have one thing to really proclaim, and what's that? It's the Word of God. And so we have to have confidence in the Word of God. It's, it's tempting to think we have to add something else to it. 
Well, the word of God says this, but also we've got all this other evidence over here. Well, that, that to me, in, in many respects, is actually there to bolster the faith of the Christian, not to prove to the atheist there is a God. Because the atheist who says there is a God is a fool, and you're dealing with a fool at that point. And the only thing that's going to change them is the word of God and the work of the Holy Spirit upon them. That's it. That's all you got. And so that's what we have to stick to. So in other words, when we talk about Moses here having a doubt of God, the problem is, is he doubts the word of God and its effectiveness that he can go and proclaim it to people and they'll actually believe it because the Lord has prepared them to believe it. And that's what he has to understand. By the way, he was told very clearly, these specific people at this specific time will believe the word of God. We don't have that promise for ourselves, do we? All we have is that it is effective, that it's a two-edged sword, that it is our only hope, our only defense for who God is and who we are, those first two questions. It is the only thing we have for that. We have to go out with the same confidence that Moses should have had here, but he didn't. Even though we don't know if the Lord has prepared this people we're speaking to today uh, to, uh, to receive the word of God today. And it's very limiting for us to think that God's word, you know, it, it, the problem is, is we think, it's unfortunate. We think sometimes, well, I'm going to proclaim the word of God, but they're not going to believe it. Now, there's times in scripture where people like Jeremiah were told, you're going to proclaim it and they're not going to believe it. But we're not told that. We're told to go and proclaim the word of God, and we don't proclaim it, we should not proclaim it. When I say proclaim, I mean just speaking with people about it and using it in the conversation and pointing to them what their sin is and that God is a savior of those who sin and that God is a great God, a merciful God, a long-suffering God who will save his people from their sins and will preserve them into a holy and, and glorious eternity. And we have to go out and say that with confidence and not say it with thinking, well, it really probably won't work, right? I mean, they're not going to believe what I'm saying. We can't think that way. We have to go out and speak it uh, with faith. Uh, we can't be double-minded men. Does somebody have James chapter 1? Verses, this is talking about prayer to God, but it's the same thing really when we talk about going out because prayer to God is, you know, we ask him for people's salvation. We go out and we speak to them. So does somebody have James 1, 5 through 8? Okay. So he said there, he says, let him, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of the Lord. So it's a, it's a prayer is what we're talking about here. But then he also goes on to say, listen, if you ask without believing, you're like a double-minded man. You're like, you're like in, the, in, the, in the surf in the storm with the wind blowing and everything like that. Remember, God is here dealing with Moses as an individual, and he's, he's building his faith. He's bolstering his faith. He's building him up to believe the word of God and to go and to use it uh, with the people. And the problem will be is if Moses doesn't believe what he's saying to the people, then how will they believe? He won't say it confidently, number one. But number two, will the Lord use him if he doesn't believe in it? Well, he won't use a man's prayer if he doesn't believe in it. When we ask for something, we say, well, I don't, Lord, you're never going to do this for me, I know. I don't think you will. I don't think you love me enough. I don't think you're powerful enough. I don't think you care enough. Whatever the reason is you use, that person's too far gone, I'm praying for their salvation. Whatever it is that you're praying for, you have to pray for in faith. And whatever it is you go and speak to the, wor the world, you have to say it in faith, that God is going to do what he said he was going to do. And we can believe in that, but it's, it's often our fault and our problem. That's why God is so gracious, once again, in this, in this passage. That's why I want to emphasize God's gracious dealing with Moses in chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. Very gracious in all the things that he does. Um, I don't think, I don't, I will say this, I don't think Moses is being willfully obstinate here, but he lacks faith and he's afraid. He's scared. He's not like Jonah. What did Jonah do? Yeah, Jonah said, he says, you go and preach to the people of Nineveh. And, and Jonah goes exactly the opposite direction. In fact, I was looking up the other day because I couldn't remember exactly how far he got. You know, he got across almost the entire Mediterranean by the time he landed and came back. I didn't realize that till, or didn't remember that till just the other day. I mean, he went a long way to get away from the Lord and found out you cannot get away from the Lord and from his purpose. And eventually he's back in Nineveh doing exactly what God told him to do. He's obstinate about it. He's, he's willful about it the whole time, really, even though he prays that great prayer in Jonah chapter 2, but he's obstinate and willful the whole time. Moses isn't being that way here. He's not, he's not going the other direction. In fact, he immediately after this encounter happens, he goes and talks to his father-in-law and says, I need to leave. 
I got to go back to my people now. So he, and he goes and he does exactly what the Lord tells him to do. Uh, you know, the fact is, is that when a man is afraid and he lacks faith, there's a million reasons you can think of, of why you can't do something. Well, the Lord won't do this, this won't work, that won't work, that won't work. You come up with a million reasons. You only have one thing to go on, though. The word of the Lord was, you go and you tell them, you do this. And that's what you go and do. That's what we're called to do. Okay, so that's chapter 4, verse 1, dealing with the idea of the reasonableness, what his response is in this question. And is it a reasonable question? It is not a reasonable question. Sounds like one, sounds like the first two, but it's not a reasonable question because the Lord's already told him what's going to happen. That makes it unreasonable. Okay, let's go into chapter 4, verses 2 through 9, where we have these, these, these gracious response of God and the provision that he provides to him here. And we have these three different signs that he's going to give him, two that he actually will manifest right here and one that's held in reserve for when he gets to Egypt, the last one. And so God is, once again, very patient. He's very gracious towards Moses. He didn't, when, when, the, when Moses said to him, what if the people don't believe me? An unreasonable question, did the Lord upbraid him? Did he rebuke him? He did not. He's very gentle, incredibly gentle. Like a little child comes to you and says, but why do I have to eat my, my beans? I don't want to eat my beans. You know, it sounds like a reasonable question. Some people don't like beans, I guess. It's not reasonable if the parents have said you're going to eat some beans now and they're going to be good for you. But yet you might still answer those questions very patiently at that point. That's what God does with us like little children. He didn't rebuke him for unbelief. Rather, he provided not just one sign and not just two signs, but three signs. So he doesn't give him just one and say, listen, this will work for you. Let me, let me check my deck of cards, you know, for the things that could work. Let's pull this one out and you go use that one. He gives him three very specific and distinct signs, which we're going to look at. And they all have, as the Lord does, they all have these, these things going on in them that we can dig in and understand more about God's purpose and how he works, why they differ from each other. Uh, and he gives him three different signs, three evidences that, of the divine source for what Moses was saying to the children of Israel. So when he gets there, they'll say, you know, if they did say to him, well, did the Lord really appear to you? Did, did you really talk to the Lord? We don't, we're not sure we believe you. We know what you did 40 years ago. You've been gone for 40 years. He says, I've got these three signs, these three things that will validate what I'm saying to you that the Lord has done, has said these things to me, and he will do these things for us that he has said he will do. So these signs have, I want to say, first of all, they have three different purposes, these, these uh, three things that he gave him, not, not aligned with the three signs, but just the three together have three purposes. The first one is to bolster whose faith? Moses, because he's the one asking the question, what if they don't believe? So the first, the first thing is, is what if they don't believe me uh, in what I'm saying? And he, he immediately gives him these three signs so that when Moses will go, he can say, well, listen, probably at face value, they might not believe me, but based on these signs that the Lord has given me, they will. And so now Moses' faith can be, can be strengthened as a result that the Lord will do these things through him and with him uh, to bring about the deliverance of the children of Israel. But the second thing is they were there to bolster the faith of the elders of Israel. Uh, in chapter 4 and verse uh, 5, he says, let me go find it. Um, that they may believe, verse 5, they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. It's very specifically the answer to Moses' question. What if they don't believe you appeared to me? They will believe because you're going to do this, just one sign. We'll do it, actually. But then he's going to graciously give them two more. So he, can never, he would never doubt, should never doubt, uh, the veracity and the authority of God in sending him at this time. So they're, they're there to bolster the faith of the elders of, of Israel. Um, these, it, it, these signs, by the way, we're going to look at them, they're all symbols uh, of Egyptian power. Now remember, the children of Israel are under the authority and the power of the Egyptians at this time. But we're going to see as we develop this that all three signs are actually an attack uh, and, and, a, and a, a validation of God's authority over Israel, even in their most powerful things. So the first one, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, if you looked at Pharaoh, if you walked up to Pharaoh and he's sitting on his throne and you looked right into his face, what else are you seeing pretty much the whole time? If he's wearing his, his big headdress thing, his thing, his golden thing, what's he got? What's right on the front? Serpent. A serpent sticking right out of the front. So as soon as you look at Pharaoh, and the, by the way, he's holding a staff also. He's holding a rod and a scepter. What's on top of that? A serpent. In other words, Pharaoh's authority was aligned with this idea of a serpent. And here God's going to show the authority through Moses over a serpent. 
So this, these things, we're going to look at the other two and develop those as well in the same way. They were there to show God's power uh, over the Egyptians, which were the, the taskmasters, the slaveholders of the children of Israel, and they'd have to be released from them in order to go. And he's showing immediately, I have power over the Egyptians in all this, that even a man like Moses, which we'll look at how weak he was in all this, uh, could cause fear in the Egyptians. Um, and so, so that's, it, it bolsters the faith, uh, but it also bolsters the faith not only of the children of Israel in God who was giving the signs through Moses, but to Moses himself. They'd say, well, yeah, we do believe you, what you said, because of what you're doing here. So the, the elders would now believe, as he said in verse 5, they will believe you. But they're also pictures um, of the, these three things. They're also pictures, and we'll develop this also. The first one is, is, that, is that, in many respects, God would grab the serpent by the tail, the, little, the, the, the Israelite authority would be grabbed by the tail and be in God's hand to do with whatever he wanted to. He could turn it into a staff. He could do whatever he wanted to, but he had complete authority. So we have that first picture. The second one is, is that a person who had leprosy, later on we get to know more about this in the, the laws the, of, of Israel that he gives them about the idea of leprosy and things like that. What did they, if they got leprosy, what did they have to do? First of all, they had to, leave the camp. I mean, they couldn't be amongst the people. They had to leave, okay? The second thing is, though, that eventually they were seeking, and, and their, their, their proof of their deliverance was in what? That they would go to the priest, and the priest would inspect them and say, you are now what? Pure, clean, you're clean, you're pure. That God has the ability, the second picture we're going to see here is that God has the ability to purify his people, to cleanse his people. Once again, when we look at the entire Exodus account, and the deliverance of the children of Israel. We are not simply being or seeing a people being delivered from what ails them, from their problems, like living in slavery and having a difficult life. That is not what God does. God is also going to do what with them? He's going to take them to the promised land and he's going to purify his people. They will be his people and they will serve him. Now, they're a stiff-necked people just like us in many respects. Thankfully, we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. But they are a stiff-necked people, and they go off and they serve other gods, and God purifies them and brings them back uh, to serve him again, and then they go off again, and then they come back again, and eventually, though, they will receive their Messiah. They will accept and see him as the Messiah, and they will be a people purified for God's purpose, eventually for eternity, as all of us look forward to as well. So the fact is God could cleanse his people and make them pure. Uh, he can take the banished, like Moses, by the way, who's been banished for 40 years, and restore them back to the purpose he had for them the whole time. He can do that as well. And the final thing is that he could turn what supports life. See, what do you need in order to have life? You got to have water, okay? You can actually go without food for a while, but you can't go without water for very long. You have to have water. What is, what is Moses then going to turn, and eventually with the Nile, is going to turn the water into? And where is life? The life is in the blood. God has the ability to take what supports life and make it life. God has the ability to take the word of God that supports life and make it literal life to a person. That they are made alive in Jesus Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of the this Holy Scriptures upon their heart. He can do that. So those are the three pictures we see here. God could grab the Egyptians, the, the authority, by the tail and do whatever he wanted to with them. God could cleanse his people and make them pure. Not just deliver them from their sins, but actually make them pure, like, like we look forward to. And finally, that they would, he would turn what supports life into what is necessary for life. And that's what he does. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and jump now into the first. We'll, we'll get a little ways into this staff becoming a serpent, and then next week we'll probably finish that up, and then the other two, because um, there starts becoming some repeating patterns we don't have to deal with. So the, the staff becomes the serpent. Now Moses' staff was what? What is the staff of Moses? What does it look like? It's just a shepherd's hook, just a stick, okay? How many, how many shepherds are there in the world at this time? I don't know, thousands, hundreds of thousands, who knows? A lot of shepherds probably. How many of them don't have a stick like Moses? None. They, everybody has a stick like Moses. They need a stick like this. They got to grab the sheep by the neck and pull them in. They got to do this. They got to do that. They use it for all sorts of things, and every one of them carries one. This is a very ordinary object. There's nothing special about Moses' staff, about the, this rod that he carries around. Uh, nothing, nothing really special about that. In fact, Moses has probably been carrying it for a long time at this point. He would, have, he would have held it in his hand. You ever have something you know very intimately, you carry in your hand a lot, 
and you eventually start to know, oh yeah, it's got a rough spot here and it's got a smooth spot here and that part sticks out and so on and so forth. And you kind of just know it. It's in your hand and you know it. It was a very ordinary thing. He knew where he got it probably. He could remember, well, I found it out there in that place and I had to cut off a little bit of the end and do this and do that. But it's been the same one I've had for the last 20 years or whatever it's been that he's been carrying this thing around out there in the wilderness taking care of some sheep, you know, it's just an ordinary object. It's also an extension of himself in many respects. His arm suddenly becomes more useful and long because he can do these things with it. That's why he's carrying it. Helps him when he's going up a hill or down a hill, um, things like that. Um, it's also a tool, uh, but, but it's, a, it's a tool of who? What occupation? Yeah, the shepherd. Now, he's going to take that staff, that ordinary stick, and he's going to go do what with it? Who's he going to go see? He's going to go see Pharaoh. That's who he's going to go see. Pharaoh with the serpent, the power of, of Egypt there on his head, right there in front of him, and his staff in his hand with the, with the serpent on it. And he's going to go there before him with this ordinary stick that in fact just reminds Pharaoh of how loathsome these people are. Because remember, it's not like they thought, well, the shepherd's an honorable profession, and anybody carrying a staff is worthy of some honor. Is that what they thought? No, the Egyptians saw a man with a staff and thought, oh, what, a, what a cretin. I mean, this guy's terrible. I, I don't even want to be in his presence if he's walking around with that staff, with that shepherd's hook. I don't even want to be in his presence. And so he wouldn't have wanted to have seen it. Now, for the Israelites, uh, this, uh, this staff would have been something very comforting for them because they see this man coming and, and he's speaking for the Lord and he's got the Lord's word and the Lord's signs that he has there, and he's carrying something very identified with them as people, the staff. He's a shepherd just like us. He's one of us. He's not an Egyptian. Yes, he grew up in the house of Pharaoh. Yes, we questioned him 40 years ago, but this man now carries the simple thing that we all carry in the same way. So it would have been very comforting to see him come with that staff. For Pharaoh, once again, it would have been loads of him. How can this guy, <clears throat> how can this guy, with his lousy clothes uh, and his lousy shepherd staff, come in and stand before me, the king of all Egypt, the king of all the world, with all my gold and my regal and my guards and my staff with the serpent and my serpent coming out of my head. How can this guy come and tell me what to do? And yet that's the guy that's going to come and tell him what to do. Not of his own accord, not of his own authority, but he's going to do it under the authority of God. So he takes this simple tool, the shepherd's crook, and he puts it up against the king's scepter is what he does. That's effectively what he does. The, king's, the, the shepherd's crook versus the king's scepter. But God changing into a serpent is going to change everything. By saying this simple, serp, this simple staff, this simple thing here that everybody loathes or everybody might identify with in some way, shape, or form, depending on who you are, it will change into something different. And it will show something about God and it will show the authority of Moses for what he says that God said to him. God tells him at this point to take that shepherd's staff, that simple thing, and tells him to do what? Throw it on the ground. Just throw it on the ground. It's a simple act. Moses doesn't even, does Moses know what's going to happen next? No, I don't think he knows at all because his response is one that says he doesn't. Yet when, so when God changes it then into a serpent, when he throws it down, it becomes a serpent. What does Moses do? He flees from it. He believes it's really a serpent. It really is a serpent. That's what it is. He's out there all by himself. There's no reason to put on a show. This isn't a Benny Hinn, uh, you know, service here. There's no reason to put a show on. He's there all by himself, and when he throws that staff down, that simple piece of wood he's been carrying for years, that he knows everything about, that he's very intimately acquainted with, it becomes something completely different that he wants no business with, a serpent. And in fact, he flees from it. He, he pulls away from it very quickly. He doesn't want to be uh, anywhere near it. So it created fear in Moses, a fear that was greater than the fear he had about these other things he's concerned about. Uh, and the fact is, is he does that. And, and this fear that's created would do the same thing like the plagues in Egypt were intended to do. Uh, it was really a snake once again. Uh, by the way, Moses has been living for 40 years in a wilderness. I'm sure he's seen plenty of snakes. But this one creates great fear, both because of the conditions it was created in and the fact that it really is a snake at this point. He has a respect for that in that way. Now, God tells him to do something. What does he tell him to do next? After he throws it down, it becomes a serpent. He pulls away from it, flees from it. God says, do what? Grab it, grab it where? By the tail. Is that where you like to grab a snake? No, you really don't want to grab a snake there because that the head's still exposed at that point. It can still move around and snap back against you and, 
and, and you can get bitten very easily then bites. You don't grab a snake by the tail. People say that to say like, we're, we're really taking life by the tail. We're grabbing the life by the tail. But they're kind of talking about grabbing a snake by the tail. But we don't do that, do we? People don't do that. Years ago, I was at a, my wife, uh, her aunt had a, a cottage, I guess, on a lake, a house on a lake in Illinois. And we were there and we're on the lake and the kids are all there swimming and notice a snake in the grass, pretty large snake in the grass. And um, I was just laying there pretty close to the water and pretty close to where the kids just had been playing and that. And um, I told my sister-in-law, I said, I said, hey, go get me a rake from the, up there by the house. Go grab a rake. Well, she came back with a sledgehammer, okay? <laughs> now, <laughs> no knock on her. I don't want a sledgehammer. A sledgehammer misses things, okay? I don't want a sledgehammer. I want a rake because it's wide and I can just walk up and stick the rake on the back of the, the snake's head and then grab it behind the head, okay? I'm not going to, I'm not Steve Irwin. I'm not going to run up and grab the snake directly. I need a rake or something to help me with this process. So, you know, so did I take a swing with the sledgehammer? Yes. Did I miss? Did the snake go in the water where the kids were at? Yes. Did we tell all the kids to get out of the water? Yes. Um, so the fact is, is that he tells him to grab it by its tail. Does Moses do that? He does, but let's read the verse where it says it here. The Lord said in verse 4 to Moses, stretch out your hand and grasp it by its tail. So he stretched out his hand and does what? He caught it. It's not the same word, okay? The word that God used when he says grasp it by its tail is a Hebrew word that means to firmly take care of or take hold of. Uh, grab, it, grab it firmly is what it tells it. Moses uh, caught it, which is a more tentative approach. In other words, he came up behind it. He does grab it by the tail. But he doesn't do it with the firmness, with authority, with confidence. He comes up and he's like, I don't know, I don't know. And then finally he grabs it, okay? But he didn't do it the way God had told him to do it. But he does do it. He is obedient. And God does, once again, very gracious towards him, very tender towards him. Uh, he does it. And so it does take an act of faith for Moses to even reach for it, but especially by the tail. And that's what God told him to do. Once again, this intention here is to establish in Moses faith in God, because that's the problem. It's not the problem of the people, and it's not even going to be the problem of Pharaoh, honestly. Yeah, he's going to reject, and then, you know, his heart gets hardened, and all that's going to happen. God knows that's going to happen. He's already told us that's going to happen. But the fact is, is that he, um, uh, he, he's really working with Moses here to build his faith. And this becomes important because Moses was concerned was that the people would not believe him, but does he believe it here? Does he believe it here? This is really a snake, and it really became a snake. And by the way, when he picks it up by the tail, what happens to it? just turns back into his staff again. Does he believe all that happened? He does believe all that happened. His faith is being bolstered. It's being built up um, at, this, at this time here. So it becomes important that, that he believed it. Um, and, uh, and, and once again, the people will believe it, as God said in verse 5, uh, where he says that they may believe that the Lord and so on and so forth that has appeared to you. So this is what this is doing here. Further, let me check my time. Further, God was showing Moses that he could take an ordinary item like a stick and elicit a response from a man. Now, normally somebody walking around with a stick wouldn't elicit much of a response, especially if they were a shepherd. You'd say, well, that, of course he's carrying a stick. I don't even barely notice that when I'm talking to him, I just, it's just he's there, just part of him, extension of him. But he takes this very ordinary thing and he elicits a response from a man. And if he could do that with a stick, just a simple stick, what could he do with a man like Moses himself? Just a simple man, not eloquent, not powerful, been gone for 40 years, all of those things. If he can take a simple stick and elicit a response, why can't he take Moses as a man, speaking the word of God to the people and elicit a response? And that's what he does then eventually. He's going to do that as well. Um, the, uh, that staff is going to do a whole bunch of things later on, isn't it? It's gonna, he's going to take it in before Pharaoh and say, let my people go. He's going to throw it on the ground. It's going to become a serpent. Uh, later on, what's he going to do with it? What's, what's that? Get water from the rock. He's going to strike the rock and get water. What else does he do with it? Red Sea, parts the waters with it. This, this, this simple stick that has really, you know, throwaway value pretty much becomes, actually, it's going to be known as the staff of God. Later on in this chapter, it will not be known as the staff of Moses. It's the staff of God. Because when there's a simple object in your hand, like just a book, it's just a book. It's got words on it. Are there any pictures? No, there's no pictures. Well, how long is the book and, and who wrote it? Well, it was written by a lot of people over a long time. Um, well, what, do we know it's true? Well, we do. We do know it's true. Do you know it's true? Well, I don't believe it's true. But it's just a simple object. 
Taking a simple object like that, though, can turn people's lives completely in a different direction. Repentance, salvation, children of, of the darkness to becoming children of light. Simple objects like that God can use. Even simple people like you and me, God can use to do these things. So when we go out, we don't, we should, in fact, the more confidence you have in yourself in these matters, what's going to happen? You're eventually going to start interjecting your own opinions, your own views, your own methods into the, into the conversations, into the proclamation. That's what you're going to do. It's just what people do. That's why we're called to be humble, to be meek, to be submitted, to trust the Lord in these things, because otherwise we start trusting in ourselves. And so Moses, a simple man and a staff, a simple object, become really an agent of great change. Um, and by the way, let's look in verse 20 of this same chapter. We're in chapter 4. That's where he calls it the staff of God. So it's, it's not very long. It's, it's, uh, it's been re, 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 uh, repurposed. Uh, verse 20 of chapter 4. So Moses took his wife and his sons and mounted them on a donkey and returned to the lad, land of Egypt. And look at this little footnote almost. Moses also took the staff of God in his hand. It's now the staff of God. It's not the staff of Moses. It's not just a simple shepherd's crook. It's now the staff of God to be used for God's purpose the same way Moses was now going to be used for God's purpose. And so that's why he brought it there. Final thing we'll look at here is, does somebody have Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2? May have that highlighted? What I'm, what I'm pointing to there, by the way, is the fact that we become all of God. Everything about us becomes for God's purpose and for God's use. We're a living sacrifice. That's what we are. Our life is a continuous sacrifice to the Lord. And a sacrifice is usually consumed, but like the burning bush, it is not. When we live for the Lord, it is not. And the reason I point to that verse, because one commentary I read, I like the phraseology that he used. He says, he says, like God took the staff of Moses and made it staff of God. We have to become the me of God. The me of God. We are of God. We're not, we're not here to serve our purposes. We're not, if we were here to do that, then Moses might as well just stay in the wilderness. But if we're here to serve the purposes of God, then we go and do what he says, the means that he uses, and the message that he gives us, that's what we go and do. And we don't interject our own self, and we don't bring our own stuff into it in any of this. Well, I'm going to close there. Next time we'll pick up on a couple more things about this, about the impact on the, both the Egyptians and the Israelites um, and then we're going to go into the hand that holds the stick that becomes leprous, and we'll talk about that. So let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Our Father, we uh, thank you for your word and its glorious nature, and we're thankful for you, uh, the glorious God of all the universe, the one who has created us, the great I am. We pray, Lord, we might have confidence in you and not in the flesh, that we might not make any provision in the flesh or for it, uh, but the Father, we would certainly serve you in all manners of life. We pray that you'd uh, free us of of any, any uh, sinful nature, sinful things that we are intent on doing, Father, those things that keep us from serving you, and that you would make us pure even as we look to this next section of the text. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.